And we begin with the Irish press, which hit the newsstands this weekend, 75 years ago, on the Saturday of the 1931 All-Ireland Hurling Final, the first Saturday in September. In my own hometown of McCroom, Historian John A. Murphy. Um, I remember very well my earliest political memory at the age, I think, of three or four, was seeing a um, shawled woman with a bundle of papers under her arms and my mother saying, is, is that the new paper? And uh, certainly in my Republican house from 1931 onwards, the Irish press was gospel. The Irish press proved to be a brilliant journalistic achievement. It quickly achieved its target of 100,000 circulation. It transformed Irish journalism. It had news on the front. It was 30 years, hard to believe now, before the Irish Times, the Irish Independent, the Cork Examiner followed suit. This was for them a function of the printing machines they already had. The Irish press printing was American designed, then state of the art. The first editor, Frank Gallagher, gave instructions to his news editors. Always give an Irish angle in the headline. Do not use agency headlines. The other papers will have these. Be on your guard against the habits of British and foreign news agencies who look at the world mainly through imperialist eyes. For instance, do not pass the word bandits as a description of South American revolutionaries. Pirates and robbers in China are not necessarily communists and therefore should not be described as such. Tammany is an American institution disliked by British agencies. Be careful of one-sided accounts of its activities. These agency stories show ignorance of Catholic practices. Check all doubtful references in such copies. Propagandist attacks on Russia and other countries should not be served up as news. And do not report judges' jokes unless they are real jokes. My memory of the press was pulling the devil by the tail all the time. Every penny had to be meanly looked at. Every penny we spent. William Sweetman, the third editor of the paper and editor for 17 years. Money was tight and the Irish Independent, which had a newspaper train booked carrying its own title and the Irish Times to the provinces through the night, refused to sell space on that train to the Irish press group. We were very nearly killed, you know, when we had to run a train at, I don't know what we paid for it, 50,000 a year or something, 50,000 is a lot of money in those days, run a train to Cork every day, 10 minutes either in front or behind the independence train, because in order to kill us, the independent wouldn't allow us onto the train, and we had to buy a special train to go to Cork every night carrying nothing but the Irish press. The Irish press newspaper and de Valera's Fianna Fáil party felt beleaguered at that stage. We were subject to a great deal of vituperation, a great deal of misunderstanding. That was Eamon de Valera's complaint. And Morris Manning, former Fine Gael TD and Senator, and a historian of this period, reckons de Valera had a point. But it was brighter, uh, it, it was a good paper, but it was from the beginning frankly partisan. Uh, fact was accurate although facts which mightn't have been all that favourable to the Fianna Fáil party may have been lower down the page or in the fifth or sixth page. Uh, facts which were favourable were highlighted. But it, it was frankly partisan. Uh, one went to the paper because one was a believer. One had one's prejudices or beliefs reinforced by the newspaper. Uh, it gave one arguments to use in towns or villages around the country uh, during the long political debates which took place. Um, its editorial line, of course, was openly and frankly uh, partisan. It was pro Fianna Fáil. Uh, it could be scurrilous in its abuse of the opposition. Uh, th this was a time when, in fact, political debate was a lot livelier, maybe perhaps more full-blooded, when people would be more explicit in the charges they made than at the present time. And the press was in the forefront there. And this gave Fianna Fáil a great advantage because the Times and the Independent were dull and stodgy. Uh, they didn't see themselves as being attached to a political party. Uh, and so while they would support Common and Nail or later Fine Gael, they wouldn't do so in the same full-blooded way as the Irish press did. Here's how Eamon de Valera, years later, explained the impact which the Irish press made on the balance of Irish journalism in the 1930s. And in the founding of the Irish press, this is to be remembered, that until that paper was founded, the opposing papers who had been against us all the time could either suppress us, say anything they liked about us, and we had no means of reply. The existence of the Irish press at the time, its chief value was that the other papers had to remember that, there, that, that certain things could be published if they didn't publish them. And the ordinary 
competition and so on in newspapers uh, meant then that on the whole uh, we couldn't be misrepresented for long. It was also something of a family concern. Eamon de Valera's son, Major Vivian de Valera, was managing director and editor-in-chief. Now, the um, <clears throat> basic purpose of our newspapers was to give the Irish people balanced and complete newspapers. Newspapers of integrity that would give them the news regardless of particular interests or of vested interests. This was the primary purpose of the foundation of the Irish press and its primary mission. And in thus, that sense, it was really a trust for the people to see that they had primarily newspapers which were not tied by special considerations and who would put their mission as newspapers first with integrity that was the primary mission but it was realized very early on that that mission could not be fulfilled unless the business was structured to operate and survive as a business you might have all the idealistic purposes you liked but if you couldn't maintain the production of the newspapers in the competitive world that we have, then it was futile to, to pursue the first day. In other words, it was a, absolutely necessary that these newspapers should be a business success. You know, it was some achievement in these pre-prosperity days to found three papers in not much over 20, 20 years. This is Douglas Gageby, later to be editor of the Irish Times, but he worked with the Irish Press Group first on all three titles, the Irish Press, the Sunday Press, and later first editor of the Evening Press. A tremendous achievement. Uh, the press also brought in the 30s, I think, a great sort of new blast of uh, vigour into Dublin journalism. Uh, take sport, which is something I'm not very well up in, but there was a famous character there, Joe Sherwood, as sports editor. And in those days, papers used to put out posters. We gave seven winners yesterday. We gave four winners. Joe made a sensation one day when he put out a poster. We gave no winners today. Uh, it, was a, it was a very live and kicking paper. And it had a most variegated staff. They had chaps from the Belfast Telegraph, from the newsletter. They had chaps from Liverpool. They had chaps from all around the world but basically with a, a, a lot of people who had been in the national movement, uh, some of them school teachers, writers, uh, journalists. Uh, it was a marvelous, I enjoyed enormously the staff. There were still a lot of the people who had been in at the founding when I joined, and marvelous cohesive staff. It was still quite small to almost family size. I, I loved working for the press, enjoyed it enormously. Mitchell V. Cogley, later sports editor of the Irish Independent and father of Fred Cogley and grandfather of Neil Cogley, incidentally, Mitchell Cogley was starting out on his journalism career in 1931. He remember the first night's production in Barkey of the Irish Press 75 years ago. The paper was coming out, coincidentally, on the eve of a Cork-Kilkenny All-Ireland hurling final. Mitchell Cogley, do you remember the first day? Oh yes, quite, quite vividly as a matter of fact. This is from an interview I did with the late Mitchell Cogley in 1976, 30 years ago now. He was in RTE to discuss some topic of the day, and we got talking after the programme about his early days in journalism. Spontaneously, I asked him, could we go back into studio and run a tape? It was not broadcast at the time. Now we have this cameo of the first edition of the Irish Press. Uh, I wasn't in on the early part of the paper, on the, the dummy runs. <coughs> they had, I think, two papers run off during the week prior to the actual first edition, which came out on the 5th of September, 1931. And... Uh, on the Thursday of that week, I was a kind of an office boy on Dog's Body on, on Publock, which was edited by Frank, the late Frank Ryan. And uh, I got that, a word from him that I was to go over and see the editor of the Irish Press, who was Frank Galler. And uh, I was started as a, a learner on the subs table. The reason, of the sports sub table, the reason for this apparently was that uh, <coughs> they had decided to carry on with... Uh, Joe Sherwood, who was sports editor, an Englishman, uh, Herbert Moxley, who was uh, a Welshman, uh, they were the only two men on the desk. 
uh, there was Paddy Devlin, who was the first staff GA writer on any national newspaper that started the fashion, fortunately. The, and uh, the other the other member was also a reporter reporter status. He became their soccer writer also, Paddy McKenna. He wrote soccer as Sicaro. I got word then that then they decided that they needed somebody else to, well, I suppose, continue as office boy in Doug's body and also learn this job. But I remember that <clears throat> midway through the evening uh, of the first ed uh, ed first edition, Paddy Devlin gave his prelim to Sherwood to have a look at. This was the prelim for the Cork and Kenny, uh, the first of the drawn games in the All-Ireland Hurling Final. And this, of course, is an absolute Greek to Sherwood. Also to Moxley, who in any case was so tied up with the racing, he had no time for anything else. So Sherwood asked me what it was all about, and I told him, I said, it was like your, your English Cup final, soccer final. So he said, well, you seem to know about it, you better handle it. So this was the, my baptism to handle the prelim for an All-Ireland Hurling final, written, I think, on about 60 pages of wolf tone copybook, or no, round tower, round tower copybook, <coughs> rather scratchily numbered too. Paddy was a great writer, but uh, not much for the niceties presenting copy. So anyway, that was the, 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 the first part of it. Then there was a first row, I remember, several first rows that night, between Sherwood and Paddy Devlin. Paddy had arranged for pictures of the two teams, all half-column pictures of the players. And Sherwood decided to cork, go across the top and Kilkenny across the bottom. Paddy wouldn't have that. So Sherwood said, well, right, Kilkenny across the top and cork across the bottom. Paddy wouldn't have that either. So in the end, they went inside, one down one side, one down the other. I forget in what order, but I'm sure there was a row about that too. Also, another thing I remember during the night was Sherwood shouting across at me, what time does this thing start at anyway? So I looked up the time, I think it was 3.15, told him, and uh, he said, I'll send that out. So he, when the first edition came up, quite late eventually, it came up, and uh, Sherwood had sent out the starting time, all right, in a big panel in the centre of the copy. Um, kick off 3.15 <laughs> and that got so, into the paper? well it got into the first run but it was changed other runs there are, there are still some copies went out with that and I think there are museum pieces with some people that have them still lovely kick off in a hurling final <laughs> and it was all a bit haphazard but uh, we were all great it was, it was great fun and uh, great enthusiasm about the whole thing it went like a bomb from the start well it was an instantaneous success uh both journalistically and I suppose ideologically and obviously commercially too. On the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Irish press, Pat Kenny spoke to the then editor Tim Pat Coogan. It uh, was able to sustain itself with resources up to uh, the 40s when the Sunday Press was founded and then um, with the assistance, you see they had the, fur they had the print, uh, plant and the premises and, all, and the staff and all that secured with the foundation of the Irish press and uh, the, the rocket has sufficient thrust uh, to have a third stage then, 54, the uh, evening press that I started with, and uh, the purchase also of that uh, very fine premises in O'Connell Street, O'Connell Street House, so it was, it was successful under a number of headings. Um, the business acumen of the gentleman that uh, John A. mentioned obviously helped a lot uh, with people like Robert uh, Barton, a signature of the treaty, also was also a director, Johnny McAlin, uh, Porrick Galligan, there was a number of people of, of great business acumen who did it though in the same, I think it should be that they did, they contributed their business expertise in the same way that the people who put up the money for it had contributed for, for an ideology or cause. I mean if you were to scrutinize what they got for their time and remembering who they were, it was peanuts. Uh, what was Eamon de Valera's involvement in, in the paper on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, was it the, 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 uh, the hotline, the telephone call, um, which, in fact, I talked uh, with Charlie Hawhey about yesterday, and we didn't uh, use that piece because we were yeah. clipping everything back. We had so many interesting anecdotes. But he said he's not the kind of man who would pick up the phone to Tim Pat because he knows the kind of response that he'd get from you if you tried <laughs> to interfere. However, um, was Eamon de Valera the kind of man who would pick up the phone and, and take an editor <coughs> to task? Well, the hotline had gone cold, of course, by the time I became editor, remember? I only date from, uh, oh God, I date all right, I'm getting older all the time I'm in my 14th year, but by that time he was there and gone to the park and he was not alone about politics but also about journalism. I think I only had one conversation with him on the phone, that was about uh, a funeral of somebody who had um, fought in the Black and Tan War and was only appointed detail, it was a very courteous and, and uh, friendly conversation. Um, his association then with um, the men who would have known him, uh, worked with him and fought with him, like Frank Gallagher, would be of, of, of a colleague, a collegiate nature. 
Um, I would have thought uh, that, uh, though that uh, what Eamon de Valera wanted, would have had a very fair chance of fetching up in the paper. Uh, but as the two men were on the one foot anyhow, there wouldn't have been any acrimony about it. But and, so uh, subsequently, uh, after Gallagher's time, well, say in, in uh, William Sweetman's time, wouldn't I there? don't think um, that there was any... See, one thing that people, even his opponents, always gave uh, the late president was very high marks for courtesy. So whatever way he'd want his views put over, I think he would have done it in such a way that the man wouldn't have felt his integrity or his dignity demeaned. We've heard about the businessman who mm. uh, participated in the founding of the newspaper. What about Dev himself? Was he uh, an astute money man? Oh, I think he was, because while he kept himself uh, above the minute and the detail, he, he was very good at, uh, while he kept a, 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 you know, a tight hand on things, he let people run it. At the same time, he was able to see where the, uh, the pitfalls lay, and from the word go, the place was pretty soundly established, and everything was very tightly accounted for. What about the shareholders, the people who subscribed five shillings or ten mm. shillings or whatever it was? And, and uh, of course, the Irish press didn't pay a dividend for many, many years, and uh, it has been said that many households were divided uh, 40 years later when a dividend was finally uh, paid, and uh, husbands were saying to their wives, Mary, where did you put that share certificate <laughs> in the Irish press? Uh, what happened to all those little shareholders? Well, those, you see, they were a long time ago, and, and it wouldn't have been Mary and, and the husband very often, it would have been their children quite often, because sadly, you see, they would have been adults, a lot of them, when they contributed in the early 20s. So time took its toll. Uh, but the meticulous register, share register, was maintained, uh, both of the people here and who subscribed in America, and uh, they were all traced, and, and the money was uh, posted to them when it came. They were very glad to get it. Uh, I have spoken to quite a number of people who... Uh, you used to hear uh, two, two th comments. One was, when is the Irish press going to pay a dividend? And then as soon as it was paid, people would say, actually, we didn't subscribe for money. It was for the cause and so forth. And they were all kind of su uh, surprised, but glad to get it. The very first, the press was a writer's paper. Ben Kiley, sometime literary editor. The first editor, Frank Gallagher, was a writer under his own name and under the name of David Hogan. Then you had the whole scholarship of A.D. Blockham, who was indeed a very distinguished scholar, succeeded by him, J. McManus, who was the sort of kingpin for all the writers around the Irish press. You had Frank McManus reviewing. I came over from the Independent, where I had been a leader writer for uh, about five years, I think. And I came over because at that time, no harm to the Independent or to the very good man who then edited it, I was also doing theatre for them, but I had a book banned by the censorship, um, a novel, and uh, they just stopped asking me uh, going to go to theatre. There were also some complaints about a favourable review I did of uh, Farker's play, The Recruiting Officer. Some letters came in attacking me and the play on grounds of morality too. So I mentioned this matter to M.J. and to Bertie Smiley at the time, and I thought it rather interesting that, at the height of censorship as it was at that time, that the Irish press should offer me a job as assistant literary editor at the time. So that you did go over to uh, an atmosphere of liveliness and freedom. Uh, the Independent at the time was a bit sepulchral, particularly the leader writer's room. I remember uh, Paddy Quinn, the Paul Corps, said that you didn't walk in the leader writer's room, you slithered, and every time he came in he slithered his feet along the floor. Charles Hohey, then leader of Fianna Fáil, on the occasion of the Irish press's 50th anniversary, was asked by Pat Kenny about his relationship and his family's relationship to the Irish press. It was the um, Fianna Fáil uh, paper, it was our paper, it was simply the Irish, the paper to which in our family was regarded as the one that expressed the uh, national outlook on life. When you were reading uh, the Irish press, were you conscious that that was um, a view of things, but not maybe the overview, that there were other points of view which you would find in other newspapers? No, when one was young, it was very much a question of enthusiasm and belief and in, in causes, and uh, to that extent, the Irish press expressed uh, one's view, uh, gave a, a, a view of life and of national life that was entirely in keeping with one's own thoughts and sentiments. Now, the special close relationship which existed between the Fianna Fáil party and the Irish press at the beginning, and to uh, the extent of ownership still to the present day, how do you think it has evolved from what might be termed a propagandist uh, newspaper at the beginning to a legitimate newspaper today? Of course, that's probably the, one of the deepest questions in journalism, isn't it? Uh, some people say that the really great newspapers in the world are those who campaign, who have a cause. Uh, 
There's another theory, of course, that uh, journalism should be totally objective and impartial. Uh, I believe that the Irish press over the years has uh, maintained a fairly balanced line between these two conflicting points of view. It certainly, in general, has been a national with a strong Republican outlook, uh, basically pro Fianna Fáil, but on the other hand, uh, fairly objective, uh, particularly so in recent years. From the outset, someone, and I think it was Eamon de Valera himself, decided to aim the paper at a certain section of the Irish public. Brandon O'Hare was Irish editor of the Irish press for a number of years. And they aimed it particularly at the schools, at the teachers. And GA coverage, which they pioneered, it was the first paper ever, uh, to give a full page preliminary in their very first issue to the All-Ireland Hurling Final, something which is hard to believe now. They also uh, aimed the Irish page at the teachers. Uh, Carol O'Dall was appointed the first uh, Gaelic editor and he uh, was very, he, he pioneered a certain type of journalism. He went out and he wrote in Irish about the, the events of the day, foreign affairs, home events and so on. A lot of this didn't meet with approval from some of what I would call the old believers who thought that Irish should be concerned with matters Irish and matters folkloric. But uh, they certainly, the, the paper did pioneer this kind of journalism. It also pioneered the extensive coverage of Gaelic games. The Evening Press made a big impact in the mid-1950s, a new title in the Evening Field, which then in Dublin had the Evening Herald and the Evening Mail already available. The Sunday Press, which had been founded when Sean Damas was the managing director, and Vivian was now the managing director, and he thought he should round off things by having a third paper. Douglas Gageby, first editor of the Evening Press. The obvious reasons are for revenue, for mopping up more advertising, but the secondary reason was uh, to look for a different readership, an urban readership, which, while the Sunday Press had some, was rather lacking with the Irish press. Among the noted contributors to the new evening press was the Dublin Diary by Terry O'Sullivan. He had a chauffeur-driven car because when he had a car, he always knocked it up against a lamppost or something. So he had a 24-hour service, a wonderful thing in those days, 1954. He, I think he had a lot more cash than I had. He deserved it. He worked like hell. In the past couple of hours, I've bumped off, and bumped off is the word, about uh, four, five... Uh, harms little glasses of wine. Uh, that's a lesson I had to learn, by the way, Phil. But the speed at which we have to work is because of the the ruthless speed uh, of a newspaper. The machines will not wait, and no deadline will wait. And that's all about it. Terry O'Sullivan. Michael O'Toole was Terry O'Sullivan's successor. Well, we were in Mulligan's Hue, which uh, I suppose has been uh, sacred to whole generations of Berkey people over the years and uh, Mulligan's uh, or Pool Bank Street, one of the old fashioned pubs, still very old fashioned. I mean, uh, you, you can't get a sandwich here, for example, at the moment, and uh, they don't have coffee or any uh, namby pamby things like that. There, there, there certainly is a serious side to it, and of course, the uh, extent of the drinking in newspapers, not only here in Berkey, but everywhere, I think. Uh, has decreased enormously because many of the hilarious uh, episodes of the past uh, certainly the funny side to them, but um, they wouldn't uh, in today's climate be tolerated for, for two minutes. And uh, the old um, sort of Hollywood uh, notion that hard drinking journalists is, is very much, very much dying out. Um, Miles Nagopoli and uh, Flano, Flano Bryan uh, wrote about uh, the Irish press that uh, and he was of course taking satiric license but he wrote that any piece of copy that reached the chief sub-editor on it the imprimatur of the apporter stain the the bottle the bottom of a bottle of Guinness was automatically uh, suspect and would be spiked by the chief sub the evening press and the Sunday press were by now subsidizing the Irish press its circulation was dwindling Mary Kenny, then a young women's liber, was appointed women's editor. Cahal O'Shannon could recall the impact she then had in Dublin journalism circles. She was absolutely outrageous, uh, completely and utterly outrageous. And she liked to outrage people, and Mary wore the miniest of mini skirts and would sit on desks, desktops, and it became 
painfully obvious to you that she was wearing very little underneath her mini skirts. Uh, she would go in and casually open the back of her dress, her blouse, and uh, without any shadow of a no embarrassment whatsoever, whip off her bra. And Mary in those days, indeed, was a very well-endowed young lady. She was a tough cookie. She was a great innovator. Uh, she had a lot of courage. Um, she was a convent girl gone spare. That's what she seemed to be in those days. Now she, of course, has totally turned around and is almost like a reverend mother herself. But next from the archives, Mary Kenny herself, commenting on the Irish press's decision late in its lifetime, when it was in circulation trouble and had decided to go tabloid. Not in news values, but in format. And this was long before the compacts had become an option for serious newspapers. The idea then of going to tabloid format brought the suspicion that this would also reflect a move down market. I mean, the last time I picked up the Irish press, for example, it had a, an, um, a piece about Madonna and Tina Turner and how wonderful these uh, women, sleazy ladies were. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think they put these raunch queens. And, I mean, that's a perfectly, I mean, in purely cynical marketing terms, that's a perfectly valid point of view. If you're running a sort of newspaper for teenagers or young people, you want to get the the young profile, you go out, you want to shock the older people and so on, but it's completely the wrong profile if you want to reach middle-aged ladies in County Clare. They're not going to think that, and they're not even going to be very stimulated by being told it. Mm -hmm. They want to have a, a, a different view of the world, in a way. They, I don't know, has Mary been down in County Clare lately? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm talking... Yes, I mean, there are always going to be some ladies who look like Keir Turner, but believe you me, there are just as many ladies in County Clare who want to go to Medjugorje, who want to look at a real Madonna. I mean, I'm saying that don't forget that you always have your, 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 your um, a sort of grassroots constituency. I mean, the market now is much more diversified and it's much more sliced into what they call tranches. Michael Mills, for one, the paper's former political correspondent did not believe the tabloid format would work. For a very simple reason that you can't sell serious stories in a tabloid. Uh, most of the serious newspapers carry at least a teaser on the front page in regard to mm -hmm. a major story inside. You can only fit so many stories on the front page of a tabloid That's and usually it's one picture, one story and you may have the biggest story in the world on page seven. Nobody's interested. Mm. If a story is important, it's on page one, and it needs, pro it needs pr uh, production and portray on page one. And I think that the Irish press will have to revert to being full-page newspaper. Oh, yeah. could, well, could well happen. Well, it didn't, and it died. On its 75th birthday, we have only memories of the Irish press. The company still exists, but no newspaper titles.